Hi, welcome to Moo Moo Math. Today we're going to look a little bit at parametric equations. So I think they're pretty cool and they're fun to learn about. Okay, so parametric equations, let me move this out of the way. Before we start that, let's look at what we've already learned. We have already learned that we can graph in rectangular. That's just with our x and y coordinates. That's on the Cartesian coordinate plane with an x-y axis. Then in the last unit, we learned how to graph or draw vectors. We always take a magnitude times the x distance and y distance, which is always the cosine of an angle for the x direction and the sine of the angle or the y direction. And that's how we find um, a vector, the length of the vectors. Okay, in a parametric equation, those are a set of numbers that express an equation um, with a third or an independent variable. And that third variable is also known as a parameter. So what's a curved plane? Up to this point, we've graphed, um, we've looked at graphs with a single equation involving two variables, an x and a y, and that's why we have an x and a y axis. Now we're going to introduce this third variable, and it's in a curved plane. And to illustrate it, we're going to look at the path of an object that's projected. So you can look at this um, equation. Y is equal to negative x squared over 72 plus x. And we can probably look at it and go, OK, it's a quadratic because it's got an x squared and it's negative, which means it faces down. So it's gonna look something like that as a parabola, okay? That's just kind of what the function's gonna look like. But as a parametric, we can write it in this form and it's gonna graph to be the same thing. So this equation adds this extra variable, t. Notice how this second set of equations in parametric form have a t in it. Well, what that means is we can now add this third variable and understand a third, um, a third variable. In most cases, t is time. So usually we'll look at an x direction and a y direction. So x is usually a horizontal direction and y is a vertical direction. And then we can tell the time t that that position holds. So let's look at an example of one, okay? So here's our rectangular equation. The y equals negative x squared over 72 plus x. Okay, that's this function. Now we can look at it as a parametric and it graphs to be the exact same function. But notice right here, we can actually solve for t or, or find t at different positions. So at this position, t is three square root two over four, which means that's a time. We could change that to a decimal and figure out how many seconds or minutes, typically it's seconds though, it takes to get to this position. Well, the position is at 36 on the x-axis, 18 on the y-axis. So 36, let's say that it was in feet, to say this took 36 feet out and 18 feet up at time, whatever this decimal is, we hit that position. And then over here, 72 feet from where we started at time zero, at zero that means it's hitting the ground, the object hits the ground, and we could figure out what that time was. Well, that time is three squared two over two. It's double the value of the uh, maximum because it's a parabola and it's symmetric. So you can kind of see how this works. Okay, so let's go back and talk about some basics. So in this case, t is our parameter or what we're gonna define our functions in. So we're gonna have two different functions. X is gonna have a function and Y is gonna have a different distinct, well, maybe the same, but it's gonna have its own distinct function. Okay, each graph, each value of t creates an xy position in the plane. So the point xy becomes f of t 
and g of t. So it's the output for each of the functions. And let's see what this looks like. Okay, so x is going to be defined by a function t, and y is going to be defined by a second function, and t is our parameter. So let's practice one. Okay, a parametric curve tells us more than a rectangular because it tells us a direction and a location and time. The time is the specific thing. So let's just start with this function right here. Okay, x is going to be defined as t squared plus 2, and y is going to be defined as 2t minus 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some points to go in for t for both functions. So I'm just going to take the domain, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. I'm going to plug in those five points and at least get a curve. Okay, when I plug in negative 2 into the x equation, so negative 2 squared is 4, 4 plus 2 is 6. That's what I'm going to get out. I'm going to now plug in negative 1 into the, uh, the function at t squared plus 2, and that gives me 3. And then I get 2, and then I plug in a 1, I get another 3 out. I plug a 2, and I get out a 6. Okay, so I've evaluated, plugged in t into my x function, and those are my outputs. Now, that this becomes the domain of my graph. So this one, the domain is not all real numbers. It's actually from the vertex all the way to infinity, because notice this is a quadratic. I'll just plant that seed for later, because we're going to talk about domains and ranges. Okay, and then the y. Let's evaluate the function for these three values of t into the y. So plug in negative 2, and then negative 2 times 2 is negative 5 comes out. Okay, plug in negative 1, and I get a negative 3. Plug in a 0, and I get negative 1. Plug in a 1, and I get positive 1. Plug in a 2, and I get 3. And there are my outputs now. What am I going to graph on the table? So I'm going to box in here what I'm going to graph. I'm going to graph these ordered pairs, x and y. So now I'm going to graph 6, negative 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's my first point. Then I'm going to plot 3, negative 3. Then I'm going to plot 2, negative 1. Then I'm going to plug in 3, positive 1. And then 6 and positive 3. Okay, so if I connect these points, what have I got? I've got a conic section. I've got a parabola turned on its side. I've got a conic. So I just created a, a conic. Now, what is the domain of this function that I've just graphed? Well, the domain starts at 2 and goes to infinity. And then the range. Well, the range looks like it's going to increase and decrease forever. So it's going to be all real numbers written in interval notation, negative infinity to infinity. So there you go. There's my domain and range. Now, what's interesting is if you look at this x equation, the domain of t squared plus 2 is all real numbers, but the range or the output is from 2 to infinity. So the range of the function that's defining x becomes the domain of my parametric. So you can take a minute to kind of think about that and see what that means. The, dome, the range of the function I'm using for x becomes the domain of my parametric equation because x, all the x values, are my domain. Okay, let's try one with a trig function in it. Okay, so we have x defining, defined as cosine of t and y is defined as sine of t. Now I'm just going to look at the interval from negative pi halves 
to, I'm sorry, pi halves to three pi halves. So let's plug in pi halves into our function. What, so what's cosine of pi halves? And that's zero. Cosine of two pi thirds, that's square root of three over two. Uh, cosine of three pi fourths is root two over two. I'm sorry, these are cosine. I did that wrong. Let's go back and do that. Okay, the first one's right, zero. Second one should be, what's the cosine of negative, or two pi thirds? That's negative one half. I apologize. Uh, three pi fourths, and that's negative root two over two. That is a negative value right here. I'm going to put that further out there. Uh, 5 pi 6 is negative root 3 over 2. And of pi, that would be negative 1. And then 7 pi 6, that's negative root 3 over 2. I've got a unit circle down there to reference if anybody needs it. Um, 5 pi 4 says negative root 2 over 2. 4 pi thirds is negative 1 half. And then 3 pi halves is 0. Okay, now let's do the same thing for, for the y function. We're going to use this time sine. So what's sine of pi halves? Well, that's positive 1. What's the sine of 2 pi thirds? Well, that's square root of 3 over 2. What is the sine of 3 pi fourths? And that's root 2 over 2. Uh, sine of 5 pi 6, and that's root 3. I'm sorry, that's a half. I'm tired at the end of the day, but we're getting through it. <laughs> and then we have pi, sine of pi, which is 0. And then we're going to hit that fourth quadrant, sine of 7 pi 6. That's negative 1 half. Sine of 5 pi fourths, that's negative root 2 over 2. Sine of 4 pi thirds, that's negative root 3 over 2. And sine of two pi, uh, 3 pi halves, and that is negative 1. So we just have to have a good number sense of what these values are. So we know 1 half as a decimal, that's just 0. 0.5. But, uh, root 3 over 2, that's about, I'm just going to put a little approximate here, 0. 0.86, 6, something like that. Um, root 2 over 2, let's see, I'm going to grab my calculator. I can't remember that off the top of my head. I want to say it's like 0. 0.7, but let's just do that. So let's take 2, take the square root of that. Uh, divided by root 2, but divided by 2, yeah. It's point, it's approximately 0.707, or 0.71, so slightly bigger than 7, 0.7. A half, of course, we know that is equal to 0.5. Um, and if you have a sense of those values, that'll help you graph it. So now let's go graph it. Now remember, we're graphing these two columns. So 0, 1, and then negative a half, and 0. 0.86. That's way up here almost to 0. 0.9. Okay, and then we have negative root 2 over 2. Well, we know root 2 over 2 is 7, just a slightly bigger than 7. So slightly bigger than 7. It's going to fall right there. And then we've got negative uh, 3 root 2 and a half, so that's 0. 0.8 up to a half, and then negative 1, 0. And then we're going to just make the, sim the other side symmetric, so we're going to have negative 0. 0.86 and negative a half, so negative 0. 0.86, negative a half, we fall about here, and then 7, 0.7, 7.7, and then 8.6 at a half, and then the last one is 0, negative 1. So what have we created with this graph? What we've created is 
a half circle. What? What, what, what did, why did that work? Well, look, x was defined as cosine t. Well, that's really just the cosine. And then y is the sine t. So basically, we just created the unit circle, half of the unit circle, in parametric form, which is kind of cool, where x is defined as cosine and y is defined as sine. Okay, um, I'm not going to look at those right away. I'm going to teach you guys how to do parametric equations back and forth, okay? So the first thing I'm going to teach you how to do is take a parametric equation and put it back into a rectangular form. So remember, parametric equations have two equations. One defines x and one defines y, and they're both in terms of t. So the first thing we want to do is solve one of the two equations for t. So you can look at these and say, okay, that's a t squared, and that's t the first over 2. Really, the second one's a little bit easier to solve. So if you multiply both sides by 2, you get 2y equals t, thus t is equal to 2y. Okay, so once you do that, you can then take this value of t and substitute it into the other equation for t. So now I'm going to take... 2y and replace t with 2y. So x is equal to the quantity 2t, I'm sorry, 2y, and I'm going to square it minus 4. So all I've done is replace t with 2y. Now I can clean this up slightly. I can make this 2y squared becomes 4y squared, because I've got to square the 2, minus 4. And what have I got? Well, I've got that conic that I was looking at earlier. I can move that 4 over if I want. I typically try to solve for y, or in this case, I think I'm just going to solve for y squared, since it is conic. And that gives me, what, 1 fourth x plus 1 is equal to y squared. And there we go. I have just changed this from parametric over to rectangular form. Okay, so let's look at another one. Here's one. We have x defined as 1 over the square root of t plus 1, and y is defined as t over t plus 1. Now, to decide which one to solve for, as I'm looking at this, the y equation has two t's in it, one in the numerator and one in the denominator. So I think I'm going to avoid that one. I think I'm going to stick with the one where I only have one t to solve for, make it a little easier. Well, so let's start off with that one. I've got x is equal to 1 over the quantity uh, square root of t plus 1. Well, if we're solving for t, we got to get rid of that square root. So I'm just going to take and square both sides. So that leaves me with x squared is equal to, well, 1 squared is just 1, and the square root of t plus 1 is just t plus 1. So pretty quickly, I'm able to get rid of that square. Now, let's cross multiply, or multiply both sides by t plus 1, however you want to think about it. And I get t plus 1 oops, times x squared all is equal to 1. Kind of did that out of order, but there we go. Okay, now, I'm trying to get the t by itself. But I've got this x squared, so let's go ahead and distribute. It looks like we should distribute, so let's distribute to and get a t squared, or x squared times t plus an x squared all is equal to 1. Now, if I'm solving for t, let's move the x squared to the other side. So I've got x squared times t on this side, and I've got 1 minus x squared on the other side. Ah, now you might see it. Now I divide both sides by t squared. And look, lo and behold, I've got t. I've solved for t. So t is equal to 1 minus x squared all over x squared. So 
Yay, we've done step one. We've solved one of the equations for t, but we're not done. We now have to take this equation and plug it into the other function. So up here, I'm going to plug it in right there where t is and right there where t is. So I'm going to bring that down. Whoops, let's bring all this down. And I'm going to write y equals t over t plus 1. Okay, that's the equation we've got to replace t with. So let's replace. We've got y is equal to, I'm just trying to give myself a little more space here, t, which is x minus 1 squared all over x squared, all over 1 minus x squared over x squared plus 1. Okay, now our Algebra 2 skills need to come back to us. We've got a complex fraction. So we need to take the denominator and get a common denominator of x squared. So that's going to give me 1 minus x squared over x squared. Sorry. And then plus, well, how can I rewrite 1 so I have an x squared in the denominator? Well, anything over itself is 1. So let's rewrite this as x squared over x squared, and that's the, new, the denominator. The numerator, I'm just going to bring it over. I'm not touching it yet. I'm just trying to combine my denominator. Okay, so I've cleaned that up slightly. Now let's add that denominator together. So I have 1 minus x squared all over x squared. That's my numerator. And then my denominator, I'm going to combine the top up here. Well, what happens when I have 1 minus x squared plus x squared? Well, guess what? The x squareds cancel, and I just end up with 1 over x squared. <gasps> That's beautiful, okay? Now, depending on how you think about it, you can keep the numerator, change this to multiplication, and take the denominator's reciprocal and multiply, or if you can just say, oh, yeah, those will cancel out. So what am I left with? 1 minus x squared, and that's what y is equal to. So guess what that is? That is a parabola that faces down. If you prefer it in this form, you can write it as y is equal to negative x squared plus 1. But it's a parabolic function if you were to graph it. It crosses the x-axis at positive 1, and it faces down. And boom, that's what the graph's going to look like. So you just change that graph from a parametric form to a quadratic form. So that was, that was a pretty tricky one. Okay, let's see if we can do one with sines and cosines. Okay, we're going to try to eliminate a parameter this time with sines and cosines. So just like before, we solve for t. Well, we can't really solve for t, but we can solve for cosine t and sine t. So let's do that. So we're going to take each equation, and we're going to solve them for sine and cosine. So let's start with x. So x is equal to 3 cosine, and I like to scoop my t so I don't get it confused. Okay, then I want to get the cosine t by itself, so let's divide both sides by 3. Pretty easy. So I have x over 3 is equal to cosine of t. I'm going to do the same thing with the y equation, I'm starting off with y is equal to 4 sine t. I want to get the sine t by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by 4. And we end up with y over 4 is equal to sine t. Now, this is where we're going to have to use some equation that we know that's a trig identity to help us out. Well, what? What basic trig identity involves sine and cosine? Well, hopefully you are thinking, oh, we know this identity that sine, a cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, what is that equal to? And that equals 1. That is the most basic of all trig functions. Well, we're going to take that. We're going to plug in our sine and our cosine. So cosine right here, that's going to be x over 3. 
but in the equation don't we have to square it so let's square all that and then over here I've got a sign I can replace with whoops right here with y over 4 and I can take that and I can square it so let's clean this up slightly that's going to be x squared all over 9 and the other one's going to give me a y squared all over 16 and that is equal to 1. Well what function is or what it's not a function what conic is that? I hope you recognize that as an ellipse. That is indeed an ellipse that faces up and down, one of these tall skinny ones, and the center is zero, zero, you're going to go left and right three and up and down four, and you can draw that, that ellipse. So there's another one. Okay, let's look at eliminating one more set of parameters. This time, this involves tangent and secant. So we're going to treat these just like we did the last one, sines and cosines. We're going to solve x in terms of tangent and y in terms of secant t. So let's solve these. So the first one, I'm just going to take the equation. I'm going to add 4 to both sides. So I get x plus 4 is equal to 3 tangent t. And then to get the tangent oops, by itself, it's a little hard to do this with your finger, divide by 3, divide by 3, and you can see tangent is equal to this quantity x plus 4 over 3. Let's do the same thing for secant. Let's add 7 to both sides. And that leaves us with negative 2 secant t. And then divide both sides by negative 2. And what do we get? We get the quantity x plus 7 over negative 2 is equal to secant t. Now, we solve for those trig functions. Now we need to come up with an identity that we know. Well, we know the identity tangent squared theta plus 1 is equal to secant squared theta. And that's just generated from cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 when you divide them all by tangent. Okay, so or all by cosine. Now we can take this identity and rewrite it as secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta equals 1. And I'm going to use this form of the identity to now plug in. So let's take our secant right here. We're going to replace it with y plus 7 over negative 2. So replace that with y plus 7 over negative 2. And then I've got to square that minus the quantity. What do we have for tangent? Tangent was x plus 4 over 3. And we're going to square that one. Now we just need to clean it up slightly. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, square the top. So y plus seven. I'm actually not going to foil it, multiply it all out. I'm just going to write it as a perfect square over negative two squared is four minus the quantity x plus four on top. I'm just going to leave that as a binomial. And I'm going to square my denominator. 3 squared is 9 is equal to 1. And there we go. There's my equation. Now, I hope you recognize what that is. That right there is one of our conics. That conic is a hyperbola. So, anytime you have these secants and tangents, you are going to end up with a hyperbola hyperbola answer. Now, which way does this face? This is a hyperbola where the y squared is positive. So that means it's going along the y-axis. It's going to be up and down. It's going to face up and down. The center is at what? Negative 4, negative 7. 
So you'll be at negative 4, negative 7 down there somewhere, and it's going to face up and down. That's the transformation. Um, and then your A is going to be 2, and your B is going to be 9, and that's the direction, X and Y direction, that it goes up and down to then graph it. So hopefully you recognize those. So I've got a few more of these problems to practice, but um, and we can make another video and go back over those, but that's the general idea. So finding these equations, that's how you, you find the equation. Um, I don't know if I've done finding the parametric equation given, I don't think I have. Let's do a parametric equation from a rectangular form, okay? Let's try these. I've got three of these, and this will at least give you a couple examples. So we're going to start with y is equal to 1 minus x squared. And earlier in the example, we actually found this rectangular equation given a parametric. But this time, we're going to start with this quadratic in rectangular form. And we're going to change it so it's a parametric. So when, you, when you're writing parametrics, you need two equations, one for x and one for y. So at the end, you're going to have two separate functions defining x and y. So let's start with, this is right now what y is equal to, but it's not in terms of t. And that's where the problem is. We don't have this in terms of t, and we need to rewrite it. So what you're going to do is you're going to be given a value for x. So x is defined in the first example as x is equal to t. So this one's really easy. We're just saying x and t are the same thing. So I can just say, well, that means my equation is x is equal to t. Well, then what is y going to be? Well, all I'm going to do is substitute for x the value t. So y is equal to 1 minus t squared. There you go. And that's going to be the equation for y. That's it. That's all there is to it on that one. Okay, so let's try one that's got a little bit more to it. Okay. Still working with this quadratic up here, this y is equal to 1 minus x squared. We want to write it in terms of t, but this time t is 1 minus x. Okay, so we don't know what x is yet, but we can solve for x. So for the second example, I'm going to take t equals 1 minus x, and I'm going to solve it for x. So let's subtract 1, so we get t minus 1 is equal to negative x, and then divide everything by negative 1 or multiply through by negative 1, and I end up with 1 minus t is equal to x. So there's my equation for x, and I'm, I like my x to be on my left just so I can see it. I just think it helps for parametric form. There is my first equation. x is equal to 1 minus t. Now, I can take this equation and plug it in to my function right here for x. So y is equal to 1 minus the quantity. Well, we just defined it to be 1 minus t. That's what x is squared. Now, we need to clean this up a little bit because we can multiply that out. So y equals 1 minus the quantity, 1 minus 2t plus t squared. Okay, and all I've done is multiply 1 minus t times 1 minus t, and I've multiplied it out to get this binomial or trinomial. Now let's distribute this negative in. That changes things up a little bit. So I have 1 minus 1 plus 2t minus t squared. Well, 1 minus 1 is just 0, so the 1's cancel. And so y is just defined as 2t minus t squared. And that is the equation right there for y. So let's go down. So we write the set because when you're writing a parametric set of parametrics, you have to have x defined and y defined. So there we go. There's my set of parametrics right here. Okay, and that's when t is equal to 1 minus x.
Okay, what happens if we have t defined as one half the square root of x? Okay, well, first thing we need to do is solve for x so we can define what our equation for x is. So let's start with t equals one half square root x. Um, multiply by both sides by 2, so 2t two is equal to square root of x, and to get rid of a square root, we're trying to solve for x, so square both sides, and I get 4t squared. That's what x is equal to, so boom, I've got my first equation. x is equal to 4t squared. Now, how do we get y? Well, how do we know what y is equal to in terms of t? We go up here and plug in a 4t squared. So y is equal to 1 minus the quantity 4t squared, all squared. Hmm. Don't forget to square the entire quantity. So that's going to be 1, y is equal to 1 minus 16 t to the fourth power. Boom, there it is. That is what my second equation is equal to. So let's, whoops, let's bring it on down here. And that is what we define y to be. So there's our other set. Let's box it so we see our answers. Okay, there's our set of parametric equations. And that's how you do it. That's how you find parametric equations from rectangular. You have to be given some value, whatever uh, t, t is equal to, and solve for x, and then substitute and find y. And that's how you write parametric equations. I hope this video was helpful and helps you remember how to find parametric equations and rectangular equations.